as we begin this morning, I want to thank you again for being able to be with you and appreciate uh, our family getting this opportunity to be together with you this morning for worship. Uh, there's one small thing Slate forgot about the last part of the story, and that was there was actually aerosol cans inside. We just piled everything into that, so it was a, quite an explosion, but it was something we learned. I was able to kick the gas can just fast enough before it exploded, but it was everywhere. And he tells that everywhere we go. <laughs> I'll never get away from it. Got to come up with a better story. But I won't return the favor. I won't tell you some stories about Slate. We appreciate, again, being with you. And, and we, we have really enjoyed uh, our time together on Wednesday and again today. And I hope we uh, have continued to have a great day today. It's always a great day when we're together with God's people. And we sing praise and we pray together and we commune. And we talk about things that we ought to be talking about every day of our lives when we're in here together. This morning, we are going to continue to talk about some of these traveling tips, we'll call it, for the spiritual journey. And I want to encourage you to open your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to get started there in just a minute. Matthew chapter 16. And I hope that you don't take this as, uh, I feel like I'm some kind of an expert on these things. I still have my family in the vehicle. We're all in the same direction, headed towards heaven. Uh, what we're doing is we're looking at some great biblical principles and some teachings that can help us all get to heaven with our family on board and learn to grow uh, with one another and help each other on the road. It's very hard sometimes when people want to give you advice when you're driving. Uh, roll down the window. We had a guy just a couple weeks ago, we were driving next to Target there on 59 and Gulf Shores if you've been there and uh, he decided there's three lanes of traffic and we were in the middle lane and he decided he wanted to go to the other side and he just came right across in front of us and, and he almost hit the passenger side door. Sarah usually drives about 95% of the time. I've got ADD, so I'm kind of looking at everything. A bad track record. So I'm sitting there in the car, and here he comes, and, I, and he almost hits us, and we have to go to the third lane. He finally straightens up, and I roll my window down, and I say, what are you thinking? And uh, of course, he doesn't respond. He wasn't thinking. But sometimes when you're on the road, it's hard to take advice from other people going in the same direction. But in the church, it shouldn't be that way. We should be able to encourage each other as we're trying to take this trip together in life. One of the things we need to remember, uh, of course, our, our PowerPoint is how do we get to heaven with our family on board? One thing we need to remember is that the people around us, they're not our enemies. They're not our enemies. Satan is the one that's against us. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Our family has been provided to us by God to help encourage us get in the right direction. Our parents and even our children. Parents can, of course, encourage their kids, and likewise, there comes that day when our kids can turn that spiritual conversation back to us. And what an awesome day it is to be able to realize your children are walking in a right relationship with God, and they see it. They see the direction so clearly, just as you have seen it. Now, earlier this morning, we talked about improving communication on this journey. Uh, we talked about how we need to encourage each other, and we talked about some different uh, things that can help our communication to kind of let go of some things. We need to remember, though, this morning that even though we may be full of joy and we may be focused on the journey and we may be staying positive and we've got this goal in mind of getting to that eternal destination, we have to be reminded it's not going to be easy. But you know, God never told us it was going to be easy. We're getting there, but sometimes just a little later than expected. I've told our church family several times we taught through Revelation for about six months. And I said, I'm praying that the Lord come soon. That was the prayer of John in the end of Revelation. Lord, come quickly. And that may be your prayer. But it takes a while. We have to wait on God. Certainly a God who is long-suffering. He, he waits on us a lot. We need to wait upon Him. We are trailblazing this morning. We're starting a path, a unique path, that I don't know any generation before us here today has traveled before. We, we're calling it, and, and scholars call this, the post-Christian age, where we think it looks like, and I'm going to be negative here for a second, it looks almost as if Christianity has started to take a different path. It looks as if, you know, other religions are growing faster, and, and it looks like persecution is growing at an alarming rate, and, and sometimes we look at that and we say, what's going on? Surely there's got to be some kind of a sign. Maybe there's some some things we can do to change these. We see it on the horizon. What can we do to change direction? But we look at the Christian home under attack, and we look at people talking about old-fashioned values or archaic 
values. And our homes are bombarded with so many things today. And it takes its toll on us on this journey. It's evident that there's a loss for respect for purity and the meaning of life and the definition of marriage and all these things are changing and we're watching and we're thinking, oh, there's this chaos in the world. The failure of the father figure in some homes. Distortion of the woman's role. No fault divorce. Cohabitation. Children and youth rebelling. Showing less respect for the elderly. All that authority has kind of gone down the tubes. There's no respect for authority today. Family members are confused. We wring our hands and we start shaking our heads and wondering why. Why is all this happening? Now let me tell you this morning the positive, And that is God is still in control. This is not the end. We're in the middle of a journey here. We haven't yet reached the climax. We haven't gotten to the destination. We hit a few roadblocks along the way. We'll talk about those this afternoon. And there are difficult things we have to face. God never said it was going to be easy. We have to remember that there is control in the midst of chaos. I want to tell you this morning that God, not only is He in control, but His promises are still just as true today as they were yesterday or any day before. We need to encourage one another that God is the one that is for us. He's not against us. And God's people are here to encourage us not to tear us down. Our Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And friends, He is the same God who moves stones and raises the dead and gives hope to the hurting. He's a worker of miracles. He has a master plan. We just have to stay focused. We have to stay on board with the vision that God has for His people. We need a GPS. We got it. We need a map. It's laid out for us. We need an example. Jesus, fix your eyes on Jesus. We believe in God. Jesus says, you believe in God, you believe also in me. You believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. The building blocks for a stronger home, for a stronger relationship, it's already been laid. To ensure that you and I get to heaven together, we got to focus. And one of the words we need to focus on is the word covenant. The word covenant. Now we look at it in different ways. What does the word covenant mean? What are we going to believe in today? Covenant means a formal and serious agreement or promise. The Bible has a lot to say about this word. It talks about what this word means to God, what it should mean to us, and how we choose to embrace it. The covenant is a contract. It's an agreement that I make with God. It's an agreement I make with my spouse. It's an agreement I make with my children. It's an agreement, a vow that I make with all those around me that I'm going to live like the light. Covenant is how God has chosen us to communicate. He's chosen a covenant to redeem us, to guarantee us eternal salvation in Christ Jesus. And these truths are not only written in the Bible, they're the basis of Christianity. And each of us can testify to it. The Bible is a covenant document. We call it the Old Testament and the New Testament, but really it's the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The word testament is actually Latin for covenant. And it's more about commitment. It's not just a contract, it's a commitment that we make to God. And people today don't like long-term commitments. We live in an age where that's just kind of, we don't even want a cell phone company that's going to tell us how many years until we have to renew our service. Businesses now, they, they know that, so they advertise things like, we'll pay your cancellation fee if you want to change. Lawyers know this, they do it in advertising. We'll settle your debt issues quickly and cheaper than the next guy. We want things easy. We want things disposable. We want things temporary. We want things cheap. We don't want to fix it, we want to throw it out and get something else. That's our preference. But the Lord says, covenant's the way to go. We go through our Bible, we begin to see that. We see it in Adam and Eve in the garden. A covenant is made with them, they break it. A covenant is made with Noah. A covenant is made with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob, the patriarchs. There's a covenant that's made with David. And as we progress into the New Testament, there's covenant after covenant after covenant. And then the book of Hebrews comes into focus. And the Hebrew writer in his wisdom, or her wisdom, whoever wrote it, we don't know. It's very clear that the New Covenant is better. The covenant God has planned for his people in the New Testament times is better and it must be taken seriously. Jesus must have had that in mind when he says this in Matthew chapter 16 and you probably know it well. 
You remember what Jesus has said to his followers? It says, if, my, if people want to follow me, they must give up the things they want. They must be willing even to give up their own lives to follow me. Those who want to save their lives will give up true life. And those who give up their lives for me will have true life. It's worthless to have the whole world if they lose their souls. They could never pay back enough to buy back their souls. Heaven is our goal. The eternal destination we have in mind. That's where we want to get and we want to take our family with us. We want to take people with us on that journey. And planning on this and looking forward to it, we've got to see God is always going to fulfill His part. The problem is, what do I got to do? What do I need to do to fulfill my part? What can I do to begin walking in this covenant the way God wants me to? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to embrace this covenant. We need to embrace a covenant with God. You and I, if we're Christians, <clears throat> and that is if you've been bought back by the blood of Jesus Christ, if you have had your sins remitted and taken away, and you're walking in this new life with Christ, you have a contract with a God that is holy. You ever notice when they talk about God's holiness in the Bible, you can't say it once, God is holy, holy, holy. It's not, a, it's not a characteristic you can just say one time. He's so holy you say it three times. God is a holy God. Now in Matthew 4, or Matthew 5, verse 48, Jesus says that our Heavenly Father is perfect. He is so clean. He is so perfect. And He says, yet I want you to walk like Him. Be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. I mentioned this morning in our class, James says a lot of things Jesus says, and I'm sure their mama taught them as a young person these things about God. And she must have taught these kids about the holiness of God, the perfection of God. If God is not the number one thing on your priority list, He's not on it. He's not on the list at all. He has to be number one. Not our job, not our recreation, not our money, and even our family. God must be number one. And we'll talk about priorities later, but God is holy. God is perfect. So we embrace Him as holy. We also have this commitment to a holy work that I'm committed to try my very best to walk with this holy God and try to be holy myself. There's a song we often sing. Uh, Slate was singing a lot of songs. I remember sing, singing in Camp Devos. Matthew 6 and verse 33 is another one. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. As a Christian, I have to remember that really everything I do is kingdom work. I can't stop being the church because I am the church. You're the church. And we have kingdom work and it's a holy work, not only to clean and purify myself, but try to help others. Now that doesn't mean I'm pointing out everybody's flaws. If you'll read in chapter 7, Jesus is going to talk about that in the first six verses. To be careful not to judge other people. And God is being holy, 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 not ever going to offer a vacancy in the Trinity for you. So don't, don't do that. If you think you're the God of the universe, resign from that. He is holy, 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 and He commands us. He challenges us to do holy work. I should have a holy commitment to God. I should have a holy commitment to His kingdom, to His kingdom work. And that means serving my brothers and sisters in Christ and seeking and saving the lost, just like Him. We also have a compulsion to holy living. As we read the end of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, Jesus says, you know, there's basically two people that walk through this world. There's one who's going to build his house on the rock, and guess what? He'll stand. Wise man. And there's one who's going to build his rock on the sand, and guess what happens to him? Whew, the rains come, the floods rise, and he's wiped out. We're wiped out when we don't have a strong foundation on God. Our holy living is not just to say I love God, but to prove I love God by committing to everything He's asked me to do. I alter my life to be like Jesus. I, wanna, I don't want to just say things Jesus said, and I don't want to just do a few things Jesus did. I want to be just like Him. In this world, you are Jesus Christ. You are the hands and you are the feet. Look at the, look at the words of Paul. 
We're the body of Christ, not just collectively as a congregation, but individually we are the church. Jesus told his disciples the kingdom of heaven, it's in you, it's in you. He lives in us and people need to see that light. I got to spend more quality time with Jesus. I got I to get to know my God. I've got to be filled with his Holy Spirit so I can consecrate my life and I can be the living sacrifice he's called me to be because he has placed me in environments he has placed you in places, in schools, and in businesses where you can be, and you may be, the only light. you got to be committed to that holy covenant with God. And then you take that next step by moving and realizing that that holy covenant is not just between you and God and your relationship, but that's supposed to pour out into other parts of your life, especially with your family. God has a plan. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for your parents. I mentioned Exodus 20 and verse 12 in the class, and it's very important we remember to honor our parents. We remember to respect our parents. I didn't get to choose my parents. I didn't get to choose them. And some of us, if we had a choice, we probably would have chosen differently. But for some reason, God has placed you in that home. You didn't have a choice. You didn't have a choice of the color of your eyes or the color of your skin or the color of your hair. You didn't have a choice. God has a plan for you where you are, and that's why he places you there. And children, we have a responsibility to listen to our parents, to support them, to obey them, to honor them, to respect them, to follow them as they lead us, as they discipline us. And we're not ever to neglect our parents. Jesus had to rebuke the Pharisees on one occasion. Go back and look at it. As he says that they would declare for a holy purpose, Korban. I'm going to give my money, to, we would say today, to the church, and I don't have enough to support my family. And Jesus rebukes those Pharisees who would say, I'm going to help the temple. I can't help my family. I, I, I call Korban. I want to help them instead. God says, no, you don't do that. Anybody who doesn't take care of their family is worse than an infidel, it says in 1 Timothy 5. And I don't want to be like those in the world. God has a plan for you and your spouse as you begin to think about your family. You begin to think about as husbands. Let's talk just to us right now. We're supposed to praise our family. How much encouragement do you give to your wife? Hello? How much encouragement do you give to your children? Now I know we need to discipline them and we need to train them upright and we need to we need to do all the things that God has called us to do, but we also must not nag our children, Paul says. We don't ride them. We don't aggravate and we certainly don't discourage. Our job is to praise them, to build our sons into men of God, to build our young daughters into leaders in the kingdom of God, young women that will serve and love. The role of the husband is to submit to their wife. Now, some people say, well, what about, whoa, 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 what about Ephesians chapter 5? I've been, I've been called up on the carpet for this before. That's all right. What about the husband being the head of the house? If you'll read that same chapter in chapter 5 and verse 21, you'll see it says submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. You'll also find the great advice that Paul gives in Titus chapter 2 and 1 Timothy chapter 5 to the wives who are, as he calls them, the managers of the home. We work together. Now men have a spiritual role, there's no doubt about that. They are to lead their family as Christ is leading him. But we submit to one another. We work together. Last time I checked, it was not two, but one flesh. Our wives are the greatest asset we'll ever have in our spiritual walk. We need to encourage them. And likewise, they should encourage us. Don't, don't neglect your wife's needs. Provide for your family. Support your family. Respect your wife, Peter says in chapter 3. And you better be careful, men, because it says there to us, and that's a hard teaching now, he says there, if we don't treat our wives right, God will not answer our prayers. Let's treat them with respect. God has a plan for not only the husbands, He has a plan for the wives. He has a plan for our wives. They're supposed to provide for the family. They're supposed to not neglect their husbands' needs and have respect for their husbands, submit to their husbands, manage the affairs. And there's those verses, 1 Timothy 5, verse 14, Titus 2, and verse 5. Love their family. Encourage their husband. The most successful union between the husband and the wife. You know that institution predates the church by 4,000 years. The church is the second great institution. The home is the greatest institution. 
Your children will learn a whole lot more about God and their walk with Him from the two of you, husband and wife, than they will the church, or at least they should. They learn how to grow. They learn how to communicate. They learn how a relationship truly works. And then you're entered into this covenant together, and your children should see it. I love Proverbs 31. I don't, I don't know why we don't preach that on more Sundays than just on Mother's Day. But what a great example that woman has set forth. And did you notice, as the invitation is offered for those to read at the beginning of chapter 31 of Proverbs, it says, King Lemuel, these are the words he got from his mama. The words written of Proverbs 31 were not written by King Solomon telling everybody what to do. It was written, spoken by a woman telling her son, this is the woman you should go after. This is the, this is the type of godly woman that I want you to seek after. Now see if that advice doesn't touch you a little differently when you see that. God also has a plan for you and your children your children underneath your roof, the kids that you're raising, God has a plan, a, a plan for us to grow up together. And I want to make a confession this morning. I'm not the head of my family. I'm not. At least I shouldn't be. Jesus Christ is the head of my family. Jesus is the head of me. He's the head of my home. And I'm supposed to be a physical representation of Him. He is my head. And I follow Him. And if in any way I try to take his place, I need to repent. That's my confession. Now, I'll give you another confession. I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no idea. And there are so many times that I, I'm learning as I go along. I hadn't raised teenagers before. I had two, me and my brother growing up in that house, and it was tough. I got three boys to raise. And it's tough. It's hard when you're raising kids and you, you take advice from other people and you ask for prayer and you ask for encouragement and you search the scriptures for things that you need to do. But we have to admit, we have to admit that we don't know how to do it on our own. We need guidance. We need to grow up physically together with our children. They're, you're you're going to learn with that first child. People are going to give you advice and they're going to tell you and you're going to try to do it your own way. And then the second child comes along, and then the third child, and the fourth. And you say, well, what, are you raising them the same? I hope not. I hope not, because I didn't have it right to begin with. I still may not have it right on all, all points, but I'm learning as I go. And I communicate that to my children. Hopefully they won't use that against me. But I tell them, I'm learning. I'm growing. I haven't, I haven't been given all this great infinite wisdom to do this. God is letting me learn through it. And I'm growing emotionally. I'm a whole lot more emotional now as a father than I was 15 years ago, 16 years ago. Intellectually, we're growing up. We're learning from experience. And I hope, I hope to God that I'm growing more spiritually now. That I'm growing in my walk with Him and I'm getting closer to where I want to be. Though I may not ever attain that peak goal. I'm trying my best to walk with Jesus Christ. I'll give you a third confession this morning, <clears throat> and that is I've messed up a lot in my journey. And I confess I'll do it again. It's hard. It's hard to be a father in this world. It's hard to be a man of God. So how can I fix it? What can I do to make sure I try to stay on track a little better? Well, one thing I can do is start spending time with my family in prayer. And in reading God's Word, fathers, do you want your kids to go to heaven? Mamas, do you want your kids to go to heaven? Have you talked about it? Have you read about it? Have you sat down with an open Bible and read scriptures about how beautiful and how wonderful heaven's going to be and what it takes to get there? And not just reading about it, but praying as a family that we can, we can try our hardest and do our best to get there together. And if there's something that needs to be changed, we change it before we're so far off track we don't even see the road anymore. We pray together, but we also worship together. I love to see families worshiping together. I know sometimes our, our kids sit with other kids and... And we may be, I know with us being the preacher, sometimes we've got to sit wherever there's a seat. And we may have a, an assigned seat, but ours gets, we give ours up a little faster in some view, you know. you got your pew. That's all right. 
Don't do like a sister we knew that we repuffed the pews, and she said, I always found it by a scratch on it. And sure enough, two weeks later, she scratched that one so she could find her pew. But I love to see families sitting together and worshiping together. And I love to see the mamas who will take time. I tell our church family all the time. I tell our, even our visitors. There's three things I love to hear at our church. One is I love to hear the babies crying. Don't you worry. Don't you think for a moment that bothers me. You brought your child to church. You're going to teach them about God. That's all right. Let them cry. It's okay. You've got to train them. Second of all, I love to hear the pages turning in the Bibles as I'm preaching, looking at the verses. And then third of all, I love to hear amen. A little conversation back. But our families need to be together. And I love to see families worshiping together and then serving together. The bottom line is I have a contract with God. And if I'm a baptized believer in the blood of Jesus Christ, and I have a contract with my wife, who I've made a vow with to stay committed for the rest of my life, and I have a contract with my family because God has entrusted me to them and them to me, I've got to work together towards that great goal. And third of all, I'm going to embrace a holy covenant with the family of God. And that means the church. Each of us individually as Christians. We look at Acts chapter 2. And we begin looking at verse 42 and we see after that congregation is, well, as we would say, established on its inaugural day, about 3,000 people are added to this great kingdom of God in, in uh, Jerusalem on Pentecost. They begin automatically serving one another. The church begins to get active, and each of us individually as Christians, we have a responsibility towards one another. And the same is true of family groups. We have responsibilities to each other to encourage and to help each other stay committed. We can talk about how some people just don't, don't accept a godly role. They don't, they're not focused on having a stronger marriage. And they don't spend quality time together. Or they're not defending uh, morality. Or we look around and we, we begin to see within a brother or a sister, well, they don't really live the way we do. There's a couple of things that that dad does that I don't like, or the mom does that I don't like, or they've suffered through divorce, or maybe they've struggled through adultery or pornography. And we begin to look around at our brothers and sisters and how dangerous it is. For us to begin to categorize people for the sins they've committed. I'm so thankful God doesn't do that with me and you. He doesn't look down on us and say, there's that adulterer again. There's that fornicator. There's that liar. There's that thief. There's that guy who pretends one day a week he's a great spiritual giant, but every other day of the week he's a scoundrel. God looks at us as precious children. He loves each and every one of us. And He gives us special talents and special gifts and put us in special environments. He's got a plan for us. God loves us. We're contractually obligated to help each other find their goals. God may plant on your pew someone that you could mentor and encourage to get on the right track. It's not just about worship. It's not just about fellowship in this kingdom. It's also about accountability. We're contractually obligated to unify with one another. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, be perfectly joined to one another in the same mind and the same judgment. We work together. We don't work against each other. Your brother and sister on the pew, like I said at the beginning, that's not your enemy. That's not your enemy. There are so many things you could learn from your brothers and sisters around you. It it would blow your mind, the wisdom sitting on the pew with you, if you just take time to spend with each other. Recently, I stumbled across a website that lets you take a survey, and you can read comments, too, from people that have put stuff on here, where the agenda is they want to identify your values and your spiritual walk, and then they will place you in a church where they think that you belong. It's for those that that are somewhat unchurched. And you can look at this site and they'll say, okay, based on this and this and this, we'll send you to this church or we'll send you to that church. Oftentimes people will run from church to church. They can't find what they're looking for. I always tell people if they say, "I'm, I'm not happy here, things aren't the way that they are, I want to find a better church, a more perfect church. I said, you find a perfect church, you're only going to mess it up. There is no perfect church because there are no perfect people. We're broken people. We find that when we run away from problems, we find them somewhere else. Many marriages break up because one or both parties, they want to look for other fish in the sea. They say, well, somebody else is out there. It's amazing. 
how for thousands of years marriages survived when they didn't have a choice. We're so enlightened today to think that there's somebody else out there that I could be with or maybe that I should be with when God has given you the one you should and you are destined to be with. We want something else. We're unhappy. God wants to make us happy. I had a guy tell me just a couple weeks ago, he said, you're telling me, even though I'm struggling right now, loving my wife, that I'm supposed to stay with her? And I said, you bet. You bet. If you look at her a little bit differently, as God's greatest treasure for your life, then you might learn to love her more and see why she loves you despite who you are. Marriages break up. And that's sad. Churches break up. And that's so sad. Families break up. It's, it's heart-wrenching. But in the church, we should be growing because we're unified. We also are obligated to love one another. Jesus told his disciples, you know how they're going to know you in the world? By the, by the Jesus fish on the back of your car, right? By the, by the WWJD bracelet you wear, right? Is that how? The cross necklace? Jesus tells his disciples in John 13, 34, and 35, you know how they're going to see you're my disciples by the way you, what? Love one another. If I love you, I love you in spite of yourself. I love you no matter your sin. Hello? Who could have a conversation with a woman like the one described in John 8? Our Savior could. What about the woman in John 4? What about the rich young ruler? What about all those stories? That Jesus had conversations with people because he saw people for who they were supposed to be, not for who they were. Fourth of all, if I want to stay on this uh, track, I've got to embrace a holy covenant in God's ways, God's plan for my life. Isaiah 55 and verse 9 one of the greatest passages in the Old Testament, I believe, is when it's clearly revealed, God says, you know, guys, church, friends, there he's talking to the covenant of Israel. My ways are higher than your ways. He says to the, the, to the children of Israel, look, it's not in man to direct his steps. There's a way, Solomon will say, that seems right to man, but the, the end is is death. Moving forward means I do it through faithful living. Jesus was committed to a cause, Luke 16, 10. The, the Lord's promises are that he's going to be faithful in little things, in big things, in all things. When we read the words of Paul, even in Philippians, I can do all things, you see there? We also see later in, in, in another part of Philippians, that he's going to talk about how God provides all these blessings according to his riches. And that, that's a lot of sacrifice on God's part. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of dedication. But that's the way God works. He loves us so much, he'll keep on serving and keep on giving. He can't help it, even when it comes to the greatest thing he possessed, which was his only son. As families, we're struggling and our marriages may be failing, but we need to make sacrifices by being a servant. Nobody wants to serve anymore. I saw a guy in the parking lot one time stepping over garbage, and he says, I'm not on the cleaning out of the parking lot committee. You know, that's not my job to serve. Jesus dealt with that one night in an upper room, the last night he spent with his disciples before his death. Nobody showed up to wash feet. He put his coat down, tied it, a rope, or a towel around his waist, got a pitcher of water and a jug and a bowl, and he washed their feet. Acts 2 and Acts 4 tells us the church was the same in their sacrifice for one another. They said, we don't want any poverty around here. We're going to lay it all down at the apostles' feet, and we want to help each other. That's faithful living, dedicated to being like Christ. It's also through honest living. If you're embracing a holy commitment with God and serving God, you want to be like God. Remember, Satan is the father of lies. He's exactly the antithesis of what we're supposed to be. Christians are about honesty. We're about truth. We're about integrity. And that means we don't hide from one another. We don't pretend that we're perfect. We lay it out there that we're all sinners in need of God's grace. We can't attempt to carry our burdens on our own. We can't ignore our problems. We shouldn't allow our brother or a sister to struggle and us sit back and say, well, I'll just pray with you without sharing our own struggle with them too. Our own experiences, our own feelings, and how we've overcome. 
How we've dealt with those struggles before. God's ways are higher than our ways, and He is so much greater than anything we can imagine. But yet He says, I want you to have my mind. I want you to have my character. I want you to have my qualities. I want you to have my holiness. And I want you to show my love to the world. we got to be real, church, and authentic. We need to be anything but hypocritical. And finally this morning, moving forward, is through steadfast living. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, it talks about being steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We need families that are in it for the long haul. We need marriages that are committed on day one, that we're in it for the long haul. We're in it together. We need churches, Christians within the church that are committed together, that despite whatever the problems that may come up, and the problems we may face individually or collectively, that we're not going to give up. That you can look at me, and you're going to know I'm going to stand beside you. And I'm going to help you. And when you fall, I'm going to lift you up, because I know when I fall, you're going to lift me up. That's the kind of church that God has dreamed of, that's following His ways. Men, you, you can't give up when the road's tough in your marriage. You, you can't. You can't. Ladies, you can't give up. Even if you're all alone, and you have no spiritual backing in the house. You can't give up. you got to hang in there. Children, when your parents turn their back on God, you can't give up. You keep standing up for what is right. Grandparents, when you see your children failing, you step in and encourage those children to do what is right. We can't give up because our feelings get hurt. We can't give up because the trials are so difficult, they're just overwhelming us. There's always something we can do. There's always more that we can give. God takes His covenant with us seriously, and it's time we got committed to the covenant with God in the same way, seriously. There's no place like home. Truly home, sweet home. But we need to be getting there together. No one should be left behind. You ever taken a trip? Maybe you had some kids with you that you needed to take a roll call. We have to do that. We had to do that this week a couple times. Every time, take a few steps. All right, is everybody here? Everybody here? Take a roll call. Make sure everybody's here. It's time we had a roll call in the church. Are you on board? Are you headed on the right road? Fathers, are you on board? Are you in the car? Are you driving the car? Are you leading your family towards heaven? Mothers, are you on board? Are you helping lead your family the way that God has shown you? Children, are you on board? Are you following your parents' leading? Are you honoring their leadership? Are you staying true to that covenant? Our physical house needs to be in order. And we need to work our way towards heaven. We need to look down deep inside of us and ask, is my spiritual house in order? Am I following God's plan? Have I repented of the things in my life that have replaced my God? Have I been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and walked with Him every day of my life? Am I embracing the covenant God has committed to make with me? Maybe you need prayer this morning. We're here to help you. We're all hurt. We've all faced difficulty. We're sometimes right in the wilds of the devil. And if you need encouragement this morning, are you ready to get on board? We give you that call while we stand and sing.